Can I get on to the next one? And another thing that came from that conference, again, freely available on the internet, this checklist for thinking about healthy and sustainable communities that I developed uh, with an urban planning colleague, uh, Ed Blakely, who interestingly was the, the fellow that led the recovery uh, from the hurricane uh, in New Orleans uh, a number of years ago, that terrible, uh, extreme climatic event. And Ed, uh, a, 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 an African-American uh, urban planner from um, uh, University of California was based in Australia at the time. And this, we, we developed this 10-point checklist to really open up the conversation about those connections between health and the built environment in Australia. And indeed, around that time, uh, the United Nations uh, was having uh, a meeting in Copenhagen, uh, the so-called COP meeting, the Conference of the Parties on Climate Change. This was around 2009. And the work that we were doing was picked up in these 10 principles for sustainable city governance that were proposed for that meeting. So rediscover the city, redefine the city. A redefined city value. Uh, I better come over here so I can read them. I just can't see it very well. Do this yeah. No, no, that's perfectly fine. Um, involve everyday experts. Break down the silos. Uh, redistribute. No, that's fine. Anyway, don't worry. About it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. So I just brought through here because I think um, I think these are the sorts of things that underpin your Think City initiative here rediscovering the city, redefining city value, involving everyday experts, getting the community involved in decision making. Lots of expertise. It doesn't reside all in the universities. We all live and enjoy cities, so we're all experts. Breaking down the silos in decision making, redistributing urban decision making, so it's not just a, a governmental thing, it involves industry and communities. De-designing urban planning so we let cities evolve rather than imposing a formula on them. Yeah. Promoting corporate governance so that industry has responsibility uh, as we all do for urban futures. Going global, cities like Penang, it's easy to go global when you've got a global diaspora. Embrace chaos, crisis and change as an opportunity and encourage passion in urban leadership, and I think people like Anwar and others at Think City are clearly passionate about the future of this place. So these sorts of principles, I think, are uh, about reframing and rethinking uh, the way we manage our cities to, so that we can all get involved in governing them and making decisions about them. Now, I'd like to say a few words about climate change and health because it's enormously important and not well enough understood. And uh, back in 2009, the Lancet, a uh, major medical journal, of course, uh, had a commission into the, the uh, managing the health impacts of climate change. And this uh, sentence was the conclusion of that commission. And there's a 50-page scientific report available freely on the internet about this commission. Climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. Now, uh, this, again, might be quite difficult to see down the back, but there's a why, why is climate change such a big health challenge for this century? And this schema I find quite useful in thinking about it. I'll certainly make these uh, slides freely available for anybody else who would like to have a look later. But this schema was developed by my colleague, Tony McMichael, very eminent environmental uh, epidemiologist. And it's about the pathways between climate change and health. And I'll just say a few words about it, but we're happy to explore it further later. So on the left-hand side of the schema, climate change. On the right-hand side, health impacts. Now, the first category of uh, impacts on health are the direct ones. Uh, the um, impacts of heat waves, floods, fires, storms, water shortages. We only have to look at what happened in the Philippines recently to know that extreme weather has major health impacts. Indirect impacts are enormously important too with climate change. These are so-called system-mediated impacts. And there's three categories, changes to physical systems and processes, changes to biological systems and processes, and broader changes to ecosystem structure and function. 
So one example of uh, changes to physical systems and processes is the interaction between urban air pollution and weather and climate. And we all know that on hot days, air pollution is often worse and accumulates in the cities. And that's partly because of those chemical interactions between, uh, with rising temperatures, the, the level of ozone production at the ground level is increased. And the risk to health is worsened even with the existing level of air pollution. So we need to be thinking about that as our climate changes. An example of a change to a biological process is the changes to mosquito distribution. And we're seeing uh, rising concerns about dengue, uh, mentioned earlier by Anwar, and will be discussed further at the symposium tomorrow. And some of that, certainly in our country, in Australia, relates to climate change. The, the, the risks are enhanced in our cities in the north in the context of a changing climate. And then the changes to broader ecosystem structures and functions, changes to fisheries, constraints on microbes and nutrient cycles. We don't know what's ahead in terms of these infectious diseases in the context of climate change. Importantly though, perhaps the greatest impact of climate change on health will be through the flow on impacts uh, on uh, social, economic and demographic uh, changes. And an example of that is changes in livelihoods. Uh, in our country, in many parts of the world now, there's concern about drought and related desertification. So with the drying of the climate, people who rely on agricultural production, our farmers, their, their productivity of those farms is declining. That affects their incomes and it affects their health and well-being and we're seeing rising rates of suicide among farmers in Australia now. So those sort of flow on impacts, those things that we're not necessarily considering when we think about weather, climate and health. So we need to think more deeply uh, about that. Some specific data from Victoria in Australia uh, from the 2009 summer heat wave. Uh, and you can see here what, what they've uh, documented is the, uh, the week beginning the 26th of January in 2009, uh, the seven days through to the beginning of February. And the number of people that would be expected to die in a state like Victoria, a population of about five million people, we would expect on average uh, 90 to 100 people to die every day in Victoria if it was a usual situation. But what happened in that week was that the temperatures rose uh, from the mid-30s into the mid-40s and stayed in the mid-40s uh, for several days before dropping back. And this is what happened to the death rate, this red line. So initially people were coping, but then as the, it remained hot for so long and there was no respite at night, then people began to get sick and the death rate went up and indeed the death rate stayed up even after the temperature came down because there were many people who were by then so sick that they weren't going to recover. And uh, so this is an example of a link between weather, climate and health. And in Australia, these numbers are in the hundreds but if you look at what happened in the European heat wave and other heat waves around the world in very populous countries, you can add a few zeros to those numbers. So these risks are real and it's already happening in terms of climate change. Now, important point about climate change and health is it brings up equity issues. So that people who are the least responsible for climate change will be the worst affected because they have the, the least capacity to buffer those changes and that the, we risk worsening disadvantage in our cities, in our nations, by the policies that we have to uh, introduce to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So if we come back to the city example, we need to raise the cost of motoring, as the, has happened in places like Singapore, to get people out of their cars. And, uh, but if you don't have good mass transit there, if you don't have good access to public transport, then you're disadvantaged because the cost has gone up, but you don't have an alternative. So you must provide the infrastructure at the same time. These maps show those inequities very clearly. This is the impact uh, 
the deaths from climate change in the year estimated in the year 2000 from the World Health Organization. And it's a scaled map of the world to show where the higher rates are of people dying from diseases like malnutrition, diarrhea, diarrhea, malaria, flooding, things that are partially attributable to climate change. And you can see that the parts of the world, the regions of the world where that's a major problem are sub-Saharan Africa, which is scaled up, and South Asia. Now, if we go to the next map and see who's responsible, so who's responsible for climate change? Who's responsible for those greenhouse gas emissions? This is where the responsibility lays. It's uh, the United States, it's the UK, it's Europe, uh, Japan. The places that had major industrial uh, revolutions, they, they built their societies, they raised their incomes, they developed their economies uh, at the expense of the environment. And now we're all affected. Now, of course, countries like Australia, uh, China, we're quickly catching up from the per capita point of view now. Canada, our very great concern, but we have to take that long lens to see who's responsible when we're thinking about who needs to pay for action. Because most of those countries are very wealthy and can afford to put more money in uh, to tackling this, this challenge. But there is a good news story about climate change and health, and this is as I'm starting to draw some threads together for you. And that's what we in public health call this idea of co-benefits for health. The things that we need to do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions will improve health. If we think about energy generation, if we stop burning coal in power stations in Australia, the people who live near those power stations in the Hunter Valley and the Latrobe Lab Valley will be healthier and there will also be less greenhouse gas emissions. So if we use the sun, use the wind to generate power, we improve health now and next week. We don't have to worry uh, necessarily about waiting uh, for us to tackle climate change at the general level because our health will improve very soon when we make those changes. And that's why we call that co-benefits. Another example is an urban example, mobility. Walking and cycling, using the bus and train in a city, we get this incidental physical activity that I was talking about before. That's good for our health, and it's also less greenhouse gas emissions because we use the motor car less. Food choices, a vegetable-rich diet is healthier than a meat-rich diet, and less greenhouse gas emissions to produce that food. So again, co-benefits. Housing, well-designed, well-oriented housing uh, that is well-ventilated, has good indoor air quality, and less greenhouse gas emissions from heating or cooling the house. This is the idea of co-benefits, and The Lancet has a whole series of paper, papers on it. I think it's uh, well worth getting to understand better. And what underpins that is uh, this idea of uh, a biosensitivity uh, transition. This, again, comes from Stephen Boyden, who I mentioned earlier, the very eminent human ecologist, and he uses this communication device that he calls uh, the biosensitivity triangle. So on the left here, we have human activities. Every single thing we do on a daily basis has the potential for positive or negative impacts on our health and positive or negative impacts on planetary health. And there'll be flow-on impacts between uh, planetary health and, and personal health, as I've shown before with the climate change examples. So this uh, simple device uh, encourages us to think about everything we're doing, whether it's a personal choice we're making, about what to put on the plate at the buffet, um, what, uh, what we're going to buy at the shop, how we're going to move today, how we're going to get to work, get to school, that will have implications for our health and it will have implications for planetary health. And we need to get better about thinking that through and about enjoying uh, those positives from a low carbon way of living. It doesn't have to be all hair shirt and depressing. It's actually better for us uh, to live in a low carbon way. And what Stephen Boyden has also done very helpfully, and I'll just walk very quickly through this, is 
developed this uh, listing of universal health needs for us as people, both our biophysical needs, uh, many of which I've touched on uh, in this talk, air, water, diet, uh, exposure to pathogens, uh, uh, natural amount of physical activity, importantly sleep too, also the psychosocial needs, uh, an emotionally supportive network, an experience of conviviality, opportunities for cooperation, uh, it goes on, opportunities for learning, recreation, spontaneity, and an absence of alienation and deprivation, a sense of belonging, purpose, and love. We all need these things to be healthy, both from a physical and a mental point of view, and the way we design, develop, and manage our cities can either promote these things for us or it can impose negatives on us. And so these sorts of things need to be our aspirations as we rethink the city. And indeed, uh, much of this uh, is touched upon in this recent book from Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, this, this particular one being an American perspective on making healthy places, designing and building for health, well-being and sustainability. And I was privileged to be invited to do the last uh, chapter of that book on the future and how we should uh, conceptualize these, these matters. But uh, just as I uh, begin to finish, I just wanted to touch on uh, the importance of um, thinking in a more holistic, uh, uh, we use the term a systems way, because while many of us well understand these things, we are stuck with the cities and there's, uh, why are we really uh, stuck? Why is it difficult for us to change? And hopefully we'll discuss this a bit more um, this afternoon when we have our, our, our questions and answer session. But systems thinking is a, a way of understanding that addresses dynamic interactions, feedback, uh, accounts for policy resistance, why we're stuck, identifies where we might make changes, and thinks about those unintended consequences of change. Because um, having the best whiz-bang idea for the future of cities may lead to future negatives. And so we always have to be thinking about what might possibly, we might possibly uh, actually make worse. Examples of a couple of system problems that I've uh, essentially touched on today already. This idea of unintended consequences, 200 years ago, health problems in industrialising cities in England led to that garden cities movement uh, by people like Ebenezer Howard and, uh, and other planners. But in the 21st century now, we face new health problems from urban sprawl, like they are in the United States, like we are in Australia, like we are starting to see here in Malaysia with the obesity epidemic and other consequences. That's unintended consequences. Feedback, feedback's a way of understanding that sometimes uh, things we're doing just keep making it worse. So if we use that climate change example, Climate change is increasing the intensity of heat waves. It's making those heat waves longer and hotter. It's leading to increased demand for air conditioning, thereby it's increasing our energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, and it's making us use uh, air conditioning even more in our homes and workplaces. I hear many people say that uh, they used to live very comfortably in Malaysia without air conditioning, but now they couldn't imagine living without air conditioning, partly because of changes to housing design. So this is, a, this is a, a question of feedback, and we're actually just digging the hole deeper for ourselves, and we need to rethink it. And I think there's a new book coming out on the, uh, to celebrate the traditional Malay house, house and uh, there, could be some, there could be some tips in there. <laughs> but uh, but this, uh, this very busy slide uh, just shows in the centre the six steps um, in terms of uh, systems thinking. And I won't go through them in detail for you, but I'll just touch on them for you. I'll go down here to, to just mention them to you. Uh, so the first one, I better put the glasses on, actually. It's, <laughs> it's so small, I can barely see it now that I'm over 50. <laughs> um, the first step there in the middle, the pink one, what's the challenge? Discussing the problem, defining it with people that understand, including community members. What's the story? Understanding the history, how we ended up here. Can I see how you think? Listening to what people say, can I see what perspective you're coming from? 
what's driving the system behavior, as we were discussing before, where are the leverage points, where are the opportunities for change, and then can we together see with new eyes, and then you go back around the cycle. So these sorts of collaborative processes are really very valuable um, as ways of conceptualising a problem before we get on with it and try and think through what the options are for us. I'll just pass that one back to you now. I'm getting plenty of physical activity here as I, as I move around. Not long now, but, um, but this again is, if we think back to those transport examples, the relationships between urban transport, land use, health and well-being. So in this, uh, what we call an influence diagram, the, um, the, the travel that we do in a city like Penang, uh, all together on a daily basis, contributes to emissions in the city, uh, air pollution emissions, which affects our health. Importantly, the mix of fuels makes a big difference too. Like if they're uh, old polluting uh, diesel buses or if they're new electric uh, trams, that's going to make a big difference in terms of the amount of those emissions. So that's the red story. But there's many other stories at play. The travel affects our likelihood of being injured, uh, our opportunity for physical activity, as I mentioned before. And those emissions are not all toxic local emissions. There's also greenhouse gas emissions, which are having flow-on impacts for health and well-being at a different time scale. What's behind all this urban travel? Well, we need to be thinking about transport policy and land use policy, and this will have implications for the infrastructure in the city and the distance we need to travel. If things are close by, the scale of the transport task is very different, and we can do it by walking and cycling. Importantly, though, in the end, uh, our attitudes, values, and preferences are critically important, and the they tend to drive what we promote, where we put the incentives, and what we subsidise. And this is why uh, it's, it's difficult to change, but it's critical that we do it together. Um, this is one of, one of my final slides, apart from some nice images of uh, Penang coming up very soon, uh, is to mention, remind me to mention this new global program that I'm involved with from the International Council for Science. It's just getting underway, health and well-being in the changing urban environment, a systems analysis approach. And interestingly, this new program, uh, the international program office for it is to be in Xiamen in, on the coast of China, which, as I understand, is a sister city of Georgetown. And I think there will be uh, very good future opportunities for collaboration between scientists and activists and policy makers and people from industry uh, to share learnings between uh, Xiamen and, uh, and Penang and around the world. And I'm very happy to chat more about that uh, at a future time as well. Critically, though, in going forward, we have to put that special hat on and imagine living differently because we ultimately will need to live very differently in, uh, as we grapple with climate change, with obesity, with peak oil. We need to do much better with uh, Earth's precious resources and protecting the system. And so we need to imagine that low carbon way of living that's a vibrant, healthy way of living. And we need to get on with it. Two great books that I've just discovered uh, in the last couple of uh, days here, and in fact, I noticed they're on sale just outside. They, they think from that historical perspective, the streets of Penang that Wendy and I uh, used today when we were walking around uh, in, in the historic area, and this important book about the history of transport uh, in Penang, uh, trams, trolleybuses, railways. The most arresting thing about these two books is that there's not a car on the front page. We don't have to have cars to travel and to move. We can imagine living differently. And here, as we were down at the jetty, um, enjoying the jetty, we needed to get across to the Armenian street to enjoy the street art. And that's what we were confronted with. You know, that is not healthy. And it was challenging. <laughs> and we can change it. As a community, we can change it. <laughs>
We can imagine living differently. These images are taken from outside a wonderful vegetarian restaurant in the historic quarter, where they're growing some of their own ingredients for the restaurant, and where you can hire a bicycle there to move around in a healthy way. And I particularly like this one. Wendy pointed this one out to me today. Uh, when we saw the rat, we thought of uh, Dr. Wu. <laughs> and, uh, and we noticed the cat around the corner. And we thought that really Dr. Wu was like the cat. He was around the corner. And Dr. Wu would have been very concerned about these issues in Penang. His beloved Penang, you know, he would want us to be thinking about Penang's future and thinking creatively about the way to change it. And that, I understand, is the role of Think City. And I'm delighted to say that uh, I'll be coming back to Penang just a few weeks' time for a special symposium on uh, urban futures. And uh, we're looking forward to opportunities to, to work with Think City and others uh, on uh, both the local dimensions, but importantly, connecting this to the national and the global in the context of our work with the United Nations. So what might I imagine our future to be? I started off by saying that humans are hunter-gatherers. That's, that's actually what our bodies are, what they evolved as. You know, from hundreds of generations, thousands of generations, we lived in that healthy hunter-gatherer way. So can we imagine living in Penang as urban hunter-gatherers? You know, getting plenty of physical activity from Tai Chi through walking and cycling to running for the bus when we're late for the bus, getting that extra bit of uh, exertion well, like we would have speared in the past when we were hunting uh, uh, for the kangaroo. So can we imagine that? You know, <laughs> a natural diet. You know, how would we source a natural diet in Penang? Fresh food markets, growing food in the city, for example. And importantly, contact with nature, the wonderful trees and landscape here, using all our senses, the sights, the sounds, the smell, touch, taste of natural surroundings. These are the things that our body needs. Yes, we can have a bit of PlayStation time and we can, we can have a few other things, but we really need mostly, uh, mostly this. And so we need lifestyles of health and sustainability, as I saw uh, at that same restaurant not lifestyles of rich and famous. And, and I think this is what Dr. Wu uh, would have wanted us to be thinking about. So my key messages um, to come back. Uh, like all animals, our habitat, now mostly cities, is a determinant of our habits, the way we live, and thereby our health and well-being. For thousands of generations, our ancestors were hunter-gatherers, living among nature, getting plenty of exercise, and eating a natural diet. Currently, we're in the midst of this global urban transition. Since 2008, most of us live in an urban habitat. But urban ways of living can be very sedentary. The modern diet can be far from natural, and more time is often spent with those screens and the PlayStation than it is with nature. Globally, we now confront epidemics of obesity, diabetes, uh, these non-communicable diseases, heart disease, cancer, lung disease, depression and anxiety. Many of these things can be pinned back to the way we're living. It's time to rethink the way we plan, design, develop and manage cities to protect and promote our health in sustainable ways. So imagine a future, imagine Penang as a healthy and sustainable place. That's what Think City's about. That's what we're interested in working with, supporting, and doing that internationally. So thanks very much. Thank you.